It's the final round of Norway Chess, and it all came down to the game between Hikaru Nakamura and Fabiano Caruana. Caruana leading going into the final round. However, if Nakamura could defeat him in this classical game, then Nakamura would leap over him and win the tournament. Caruana just had to draw. Let's see what happened. E4 from Nakamura and Joko Piano. Well, this one wasn't so piano because after knight f6, Nakamura played knight g5. The so-called fried liver attack. Now, this has been seen, well, for hundreds of years, analysed uh, way back by, by the Italians in, in the 16th century. Um, and it's such a direct attack. You just think this can't be right. And it's been known that d5 actually gives black very good counter chances. It's been known for, as I said, hundreds of years. Now you don't take because that allows some nasty stuff with knight f7. But knight a5 is the approved move, hitting the bishop, which gives a check. And then c6, that gets taken. Now, previously, bishop e2 was the main move here. And black, it's very well known that black gets good compensation in this variation. And then queen c7. It's curious, this knight is actually very awkwardly placed here. Black has very easy development. But over the past few years, at least at high levels, bishop d3 has had a little resurgence in popularity. It looks like a very odd move to put the bishop hit blocking the d-pawn. Uh, but there are hidden points to this move. Knight d5 played. So that opens up this diagonal and the knight would like to hop into the f4 square attacking the bishop. Now very quickly, Nakamura played knight f3. You can actually play h4 here, which is not so stupid. But knight f3, safe and sound, the knight comes back, attacks the pawn, which was defended by the bishop. White castles, and knight f4. So this knight comes in and attacks the bishop. Uh, and knight c3, so white is developing. And before that bishop runs off, then it's exchanged off and black castles. So both sides safely castled. Let's kind of sum up the position. So white is still a pawn up. However, it's a pretty ugly pawn. We've got these double D pawns. Looks very strange. And for the moment, this bishop is completely trapped. Black has the two bishops. That knight is oddly placed on a5, so it's an unbalanced position. And considering that Nakamura is in a must-win situation, then probably not a bad opening choice, actually. He's trying to jolt Caruana out of his usual lines. Caruana has had this position before, but his opponent played knight e4, and he dealt with that. Uh, but Nakamura played b3. Okay, very logical. You want to bring the bishop into play. Rook e8 looks very reasonable. I mean, this, this has actually been played quite a few times before. This pawn needs some protection. Rook e1, a little bit of pressure here. And you never know when white might break with d4 and use that extra pawn. c5, there we go, clamping the d4 square, but also allowing that knight back into c6. And then it looks like it's on a much better square. Bishop a3. Aha, now we can see that there's a bit of pressure on the c5 pawn. So although white's pawns here don't look very good, in fact, white's pieces are rather well developed and there is pressure on black's position. Knight c6, good move, looks very sound, bring the knight back into play. Knight e4, also looks nice. Attacking the bishop, but also attacking the pawn on c5. 
So that bishop drops back. Now, not a good idea to play bishop takes pawn. It's protected by the knight, but black can undermine that with f5. So if the knight moves, then bishop takes bishop. And if bishop takes bishop here, pawn takes and black wins material as two pieces are attacked. Therefore, Nakamura just built up the pressure on that pawn. And this is looking quite significant now. Looks pretty nice. In fact, this is still a, a known position to theory. There have been a few games that um, reach this position. And black is actually fine. So the best move here is knight b4. Well, that knight looks pretty good attacking these pawns, so that really should be eliminated. And, well, that, that gets rid of white's bishop. And although these two are back on their starting squares, in fact, black has very decent compensation for the pawn. Um, you can see this queen, well, already threatens to take here, might come here. This bishop uh, on c8 has interesting options to come to a long diagonal or maybe out here. Decent compensation for black. And Nakamura was playing these moves very quickly. But here, Caruana played a very odd move, and he played it rapidly. f5. This is the kind of move that is either very good or very bad. You're forcing white to move that knight. At the same time, you're exposing your king along this diagonal. And Nakamura thought for some time here, and he took on c5. So white is now two pawns up. So what did Caruana have in mind? Why did he give up? That second pawn. Well, here he went into the tank. He had a big think. I wonder, had he intended queen a5, did he think that he was okay here? Have a little think. Caruana didn't play queen a5. The question is, what should white play after that move? White has a very strong move. In fact, there's more than one decent move against this, but... There is one incredibly powerful move. Can you spot it? Have a go. I'll have a quick drink. You have a little think. Cheers. White's powerful move here is knight g5. Whoa! We're switching flanks. <laughs> this is absolutely crushing. It just hits black. In, in a few really nasty places um, and soon this diagonal and this diagonal are going to be a problem. So the basic problem is this. If queen takes bishop, queen h5 is absolutely crushing. Threatening a mate, threatening the rook. It's a disaster. Okay, so what about h6? Does that stop things? No, not really. Queen h5 is absolutely disastrous. For black, that is. Threatening the rook. And after rook e7, well, there's a beautiful move here. I mean, I don't think it's too difficult when once you see that this, this rook is in the same line as the bishop. Knight e4. Wonderful move. So if queen takes a3, here's the idea. Queen g6 and... Black simply cannot escape mate here. What an, a jam. And instead, if pawn takes knight, bishop takes. And this is absolutely crushing. I mean, it's incredible how quickly Black's position completely collapses here. So, I mean, I'm only guessing. It's quite possible that Fabi simply underestimated this move. But it really does highlight how weakening f5 is. Let's go back. So after a long think, Caruana played queen d5. Well, it looks quite impressive on d5, but actually there's not a lot that black is doing here. And 
uh, Nakamura played Queen C2. Solid move. Covering that knight again, but also looking just to move up the board and exchange queens. And that's what happened. Rook D8. I mean, black hasn't really got a good way to avoid this. So Nakamura playing very responsibly. He's two pawns up, although you know these these pawns don't don't look very nice at all. But actually, you know, white's pieces are excellent here. Black's big problem actually is that bishop on c8. Look, it's dominated by that knight. Can't move. And if the bishop can't move, yep, the rooks aren't connected. So black is not coordinated. Split rooks. Okay, well, what happens if black eliminates this? Well, you can see the problem is now that the knight is attacked. This pawn is attacked. Um, that's three pawns. And the problem is that with the pawn on f5, then that has weakened the seventh rank and the long diagonal. And there really is no good defense now. Um, so, for example, after rook takes pawn, well, <clears throat> white actually just wins the piece here. And if g6, then rook e7. This is the problem when you advance with f5. It just weakens these diagonals, weakens the seventh rank. That might not be apparent at first when you make a move like f5, but later on, this kind of thing can happen. Caruana played rook d5, so he's protecting that pawn. Rook c1, super solid, super chunky from Nakamura, very nice. Bishop d6, that just protects the pawn, but problem is that Caruana really can't do much here. He hasn't got a good plan. Bishop b2, nice and solid. That means uh, the bishop steps out of this pin, so the knight can now move. And there's a bit of pressure on e5 as well. Knight e7 steps away from the rooks. <clears throat> now, I, I like the way Nakamura plays here. He's not in a big rush. That's exactly the way to go. In these kind of positions, you're two pawns up. You know you're winning, but there's no need to rush it. Just hold the position. Rook c2 is very nice. Why rook c2? Well, it protects that pawn. It's just letting black sweat as well. You can break with d4, but after e4, well, you'd like to play knight e5, but you can see that pawn is hanging. Not that that's terrible for white. But after rook c2, that protects the pawn, and then you're ready to push with d4, and the knight can hop into e5. So rook b8... Isn't really doing much now. D4, if E4, Knight E5. You can see the exchange has no effect at all because D2 is protected. Caruana exchanged on D4. A5. I think that's really Black's only hope is to break with A4 to just break up those pawns. At the moment, it's just not happening because the knight covers this square, but it, it might be something later on. Knight f3. So just super steady from Nakamura, bringing the knight back to a good square. d4 achieved something, exchanged off this doubled pawn and has opened up the bishop's diagonal. h6, isn't really anything better that might give the king a square here or here. So g5 is protected. Knight a4. Good move. Just making sure that pawn isn't going to move. Opens up the file for the rooks. And after this, knight c3. In fact, that rook is in a spot of trouble. Um, if rook d3... I mean, this, this could get pretty bad, actually. That rook gets chased around knight b5 and this this doesn't work out well for black so rook c5 little bit of progress bishop a3 so that means that nakamura can now exchange bishops 
So this is the key to exploiting your advantage in an endgame. You just approach it little by little, just small steps, two or three moves at a time. Knight a4, the knight comes back again. It's doing a great job. Opens up the c file and for the rooks, and you never know this might come. Knight d5, the rook comes in, exchanges the pair of rooks, and knight b4, attacks this one, but no drama. Rook d6 keeps an eye on the bishop. I should also add that Nakamura had a huge time advantage. Um, so, yeah, Caruana was just under pressure all over the place. Um, but yeah, the position is the main problem, of course. Knight c3. This knight doing sterling work returns to c3 just to protect that a pawn now that the bishop has moved. Rook e8. h4. Excellent. Gives the king some room. And perhaps you can play h5 just to close in on the king. f4. Rook d4. Yeah, there's no need to, to rush things. Just tack that pawn. And knight e5. So now this, this knight has interesting possibilities. You never know. It depends where black moves, but it's looking good. Rook e8 and knight e4. Swings around, looking at the a5 pawn. Looking at the d6 square. So Caruana throws in f3, bit of a randomizer, of course. You don't want to live with that pawn. So that just gets exchanged off. So they've, they've actually reached uh, move 40. This is move 41. And after, after move 40, the players get 10 seconds increments. They were both down to about seven and a half minutes each by this stage. Uh, so no real time pressure. King h2. I really like this. Instead of grabbing the first pawn, well, or grabbing another pawn, there's no need. Let's just make sure the king is secure and let's expel the bishop. Knight c2 attacks the rook. Rook d3. So that bishop is pushed away. Oh, incidentally, if that knight had hopped in, then rook e3 would force an exchange of rooks. So bishop a8. And again, there's no need to rush things. So let's just make sure that something like this isn't going to cause some little accident. So king g3. Very nice. The king wants to step up the board anyway. And then you can decide whether you want to take here or do something else. King h7. So this is interesting. He doesn't bother with the a pawn. Knight e3. Really chunky. I love that move. An exchange will connect white's pawns and well only chance for caruana is to keep that knight on the board rook d6 still nice and active notice that rook just controls all these squares so that knight is actually very short of squares now knight c6 it comes back knight d5 all that one is hopping in, causing potentially causing some problems. Rook f8. Knight c7 attacks the bishop. Threatens here. So bishop b7, knight e6. That's a beautiful square. That is a proper octopus now. Rook f7 and f4. Finally, Nakamura advances one of these pawns. And he does, does so when everything is right. Look. Knight is protected. This knight on e3 is protected. The pawn on f4 is protected by the king. And this is lovely. This just takes away more squares from black's pieces. Bishop a8. There's nothing that black can do. h5. I love that. So you can see the mating net is closing around black's king. We might be getting a ding checkmate soon with knight f8 and knight g6 and, and a rook coming in. We've seen it many times before, notably in that spectacular finish in the World Championship match recently. Rook a7. 
pressing position for Caruana to play. He's just hoping that some tactic crops up. A3, that means if A4, I guess that can just be pushed. King G8, F5 secures the octopus on E6. Rook E7. King F4, beautiful. Just controlling these squares very nicely. Rook A7. And after d4, Caruana resigned. Well, there really is nothing left for Black. I mean, Caruana was losing on time. His, his position is utterly lost. Yeah, not surprising. He threw the towel in at this point. Let's just continue it a few moves just to see how White might finish the game. Well, let's say King f7. Let's push on with d5. And let's say knight e7, rook d8, and we're getting very close to a ding checkmate with rook f8. You can see this is absolutely hopeless for black. Well, that meant that Hikaru Nakamura is the winner of Norway chess. So standings at the end, 16 and a half for Nakamura, Caruana 16. Caruana had played a brilliant tournament up to this moment, but one false move going way back here. F5. I'm afraid that ruined his tournament. Um, but fair play to Nakamura. Clever opening choice. Rather unsettled Caruana, we can see. The result was F5. And I thought Nakamura's technique after that was absolutely perfect. He didn't take any chances. He was rock solid. Perfect technique. Nakamura had a good tournament. If you look at the classical games, he won three classical games and drew six. So he was very solid, very professional actually. Um, and of those six draws, he won three of the Armageddons. I would actually normally expect him to do better than that. Um, you've got to feel sorry for Fabiano Caruana, who played a brilliant tournament up to this final game. He won four classical games, he lost two of them, and he drew three, and so he was just behind, and he won two of those Armageddon games. In third place, uh, Dabaraju Gukesh. Gukesh played excellently, won two classical games, lost one, and drew six, and he really has proved that um, he is going to be, well, already is a major force in the world of chess. I hope you enjoyed my cover of, coverage of Norway chess. If you're not a subscriber, do click that subscribe button. I want to get to 100k. And if you'd like to support the channel, then do check out patreon.com powerplaychess and check out the rewards you get depending on how much you contribute. Thank you everyone for your comments and I'll see you soon.